The council system is too complicated for me to explain in full here, but the point is that institutions are organized from the bottom up in a kind of radical democracy, where workers had collective control over the economy and representatives could be recalled instantly if they were incompetent or turned their coat. Contrast this with a parliamentary system, where you just elect someone to sit in parliament and they can do whatever they want until their term is up. In this video, we will take a look at a variation of Soviet democracy, sometimes known as council democracy. Obviously, this political model does not boast universal applicability. In fact, no reasonable model could claim such an impossible characteristic. Nevertheless, as will be explained below, this approach might work especially well for larger socio-political entities. To understand what Soviet democracy is, first we need to rehabilitate the word Soviet itself. Many, even within the left, associate the term strictly with the USSR and other analogous Marxist-Leninist experiments. In fact, Soviet comes from the Russian word for council, hence Soviet democracy is sometimes referred to as council democracy. The foundational framework of this political system is as follows. 1. Soviets are organized in all aspects of life. These councils can be arranged in the workplace, a neighborhood, a military barracks, etc. Councils are directly elected bodies whose delegates are members of the organization or community associated with the council. In other words, workers of an enterprise in a workplace council, residents of a neighborhood in a residential council, and so on and so forth. Soviets operate under the principle of an imperative mandate as opposed to the free mandate of liberal democracies where elected representatives are bound by the conscious and a loose, nonverbal contract with their constituents, the imperative mandate creates direct instructions from the constituency that the delegates and representatives must work towards. Failure to meet the objectives laid out by the imperative mandate can result in the immediate recall of the elected official by his or her constituency. This recallability is effective at any point in time provided the voting base can amass a substantial enough vote to remove a person from the elected position. A merging of legislative, executive, and judicial responsibilities for the elected body. Smaller elected bodies that represent localities can organize into a larger congregation at regional, national, or multinational levels. This system drastically redefines the democratic process in comparison to its liberal counterpart. Liberal democracies, for example, rely heavily on what is known as horizontal accountability, which is what most Americans might understand today as the checks and balances system and the separation of powers. Indeed, council democracy abandons horizontal accountability by eliminating the separation of powers, the ability of distinct branches of government to hold each other accountable. At face value, this might seem to be an alarming change, but let us consider what council democracy does to account for this loss. Instead of relying on horizontal accountability, council democracy constructs vertical accountability. Points two and three are especially reflective of that. The imperative mandate becomes a powerful tool by which elected persons would be held accountable. Similarly, the threat of recall alone ought to be sufficient in deterring divergence from adequate legislative or executive duties. Thus, elected individuals at any and all levels will be held accountable by the people who elected them directly, and not by parallel government structures. In such a context, the separation of powers and the American system of checks and balances appears antiquated. In the American status quo, accountability works loosely like so. Most of the accountability is horizontal. The public cannot directly influence the judicial system, nor can it influence the executive branch to a large degree. In fact, the public can only elect the head of the executive branch, but it cannot weigh in on the appointments made by the elected president. What influence the masses do have is limited to the free mandate principle and the lack of recall power. By comparison, here's what a council democracy offers in terms of restructuring the government and redefining accountability. What is different in this system? For one, we have democratized not only geographically bounded entities, but workplaces as well, a key feature missing in liberal capitalist democracies. In the council democracy system, the imperative mandate applies from level to level. We may no longer have horizontal accountability, but all functions of the government, whether they be executive, legislative, or judicial, are subject to public consideration. Dissatisfaction with how an elected factory council member is handling his or her tasks would result in a recall or a threat of one. The smaller council can vote to recall the larger council members. This can be effective going up the chain all the way to the federal or international levels. Even though it is now several steps removed from the larger councils, a dissatisfied constituency can still vote at any point in time to recall council members or entire local councils if those elected bodies are not holding the larger ones accountable. In general, council democracy greatly expands public input into the political process. 
It attacks the environment in which career politicians thrive by establishing a constant state of vigilance enforced by a regular public participation in politics and the economy. We will now turn to yet another modification of the electoral process that will make vertical accountability in such a system even more streamlined. The above council system still has imperfections, though it is already more democratic than its liberal counterpart. Council democracy is far more direct than representative democracy, in which candidates for election are not required to follow through on any policy proposals. Moreover, representative democracies, as is often seen in the United States, present the voting public with a lesser of two evils dilemma that greatly limits social potential. How can council democracy be improved? Using the council democracy graphic, let us suppose that a larger council voted on a policy that ended up being too unpopular among the general public. In response, the public puts together a referendum including all affected constituencies. In other words, if it is a national policy, then the entire national population of the country participates in the referendum. The referendum results would necessarily have legal precedent over the council's decisions. The power of the direct vote in various policy matters effectively reinforces the imperative mandate by giving citizens the ability to override their elected representatives' decisions. As is the case with the recall power, exercising this right will likely not be necessary most of the time, as the threat of its use alone ought to incentivize policy making that reflects the interests of the public. Whatever combination of radical and new democratic ideas manifests in the post-revolutionary society, an extremely important aspect of the transformation will be the computerization of the de democratic process. The information revolution of the last few decades has unlocked remarkable potential for organizing our social lives. To a large extent, we have seen this develop quickly in the form of social media, internet forums, increased access to personal technology, and so on. Even in our political and economic lives, computers have begun to play an increasingly important role. The adoption of some form of council democracy would therefore greatly benefit from the integration of new technology into the political process. One area that is likely already achievable with our current capabilities is the establishment of community console centers for facilitating frequent participation in liquid democracy. Individuals could have an installed application reminding them that at such and such time there will be national, regional, or local votes on X or Y policy. The application could provide regular notifications on voting opportunities and offer directions to the nearest console centers. The console centers would be very easily repurposed voting centers, but with installed devices that are intricately connected to a massive circuit of electoral technology. Liquid democracy may have been too complicated for a significantly less educated and less technologically savvy public 50 years ago, but today's technology opens the doors for an explosion of civic engagement. Moreover, previously disillusioned citizens of voting age would be greatly incentivized to keep up with various policy issues, knowing that their participation in referendums or council elections will be strictly reinforced by a vertical accountability system. Consuls can be installed in neighborhoods, workplaces, schools, retirement homes, and any other democratically relevant locations. Already existing voter identification methods could easily be incorporated into a scanning mechanism at a local console center, and newer identification methods would always be preferred and implemented as they became available for wide use. In general, a complete reinvention of the democratic process coupled with the integration of the latest technologies into the political system would result in substantially greater public participation in politics. This new system would be able to more accurately reflect the interests of the people while still drawing on the competence and expertise of individuals who the public would trust their political power with. The advent of computer technology in the USSR in the late 50s began to interest a number of Soviet specialists. Could computers eliminate the issue of human corruption and error? As computers evolved at a rapid pace, would they be able to take on logistical and economic tasks that were entirely impossible for people to comprehend on their own? Thus began the cult of cybernetics, which ardently advocated for the automation of planning and management processes in the economy. Viktor Glushkov, a leading figure in these projects, advocated for something called OGAS. OGAS was the blueprint for a nationwide computer network that would hold massive amounts of economic and logistical data. The system was going to be a means for computers to communicate with themselves from one production center to another, as well as to central facilities that would then relay data back to individual enterprises. Not only that, OGAS computers could use available data to optimize production quotas and account for changes in localized production points. The structure of OGAS, as outlined by Glushkov and his colleagues, relied on a nationwide information network, where computers were available at even the smallest production points. 
these production centers connected to a larger central computing hub that would be programmed to process data and optimize production plans according to inputs it received. Not only could optimization affect the production of a single facility, but it could also take the information from multiple connected facilities to account for the bigger picture. For example, changes in steel and iron production could be translated in modified plants for construction sites or machine factories. The smarter and more integrated the computerized economy would be, the less errors and shortcomings would be expected. Glushkov wrote much of his work at a time when the frontier in computers was basic visual inputs. He dreamed of a time when computers could register audio inputs and produce a response based on the interpretation of information. He had no idea that by 2019 we would have handheld computers in our pockets whose total computing power would exceed that of any produced in the best laboratories of the 70s and 80s. We can draw on these devices, exchange information from person to person in a fraction of a second, and even dictate with our own words what we want our devices to do. Glushkov's vision was at least one computer in every production point in the country. Today we could have a computer in the hands of every single person involved in any kind of work or production. The implications for the implementation of something like Ogas are even greater in the modern context than they could have been during Glushkov's time. This form of automation is different from what most leftists generally talk about, which is automation of the production process. While that is certainly a scenario we are rapidly approaching, its value in a socialist economy will only be considerable through the frameworks of an automated organization and planning process. Many left-leaning activists and individuals are caught up with essentializing old socialist experiments, forgetting that we have progressed considerably in terms of what we can feasibly construct on a larger scale. We now have tools at our disposal that the Soviets and the Chinese could not even imagine, 